On this episode of UTR, we're back in Grand Rapids for some malt-making men, an old goat that's giving the neighborhood great food, and a couple of cousins who've made cheese curls a crunchy career. Heck, we'll even get cultured with contemporary art right in the heart of the city. Get ready to explore the cool people, places, and things that make Grand Rapids a great place to be. Support for Under the Radar provided by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, dedicated to shared economic success. MEDC promotes the state's assets and opportunities that support business investment, job growth, and community vitality. What if the world is a blank canvas and our imagination the brush? We would use only the most vibrant colors, the most dramatic strokes, creating a world of endless expression and endless possibilities. Creating a world like Grand Rapids, where every day is a work of art and the inspiration is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. DestinationAnnArbor.org is your gateway to Chelsea, Dexter, Manchester, Milan, Celine, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor. Find out the best spots to eat, festivals to attend, activities to do, and places to discover at DestinationAnnArbor.org. There's something special about the pride, the skill, and the passion it takes to build something great. The Construction Association of Michigan, CAM, understands that passion and has been providing contractors with the resources they need since 1885. I've been around the world, but there's one place I keep coming back to. And the more I explore, the more I realize it's the place to be. I'm Tom Dalton, and this is Under the Radar Michigan. You know, we gravitate towards Grand Rapids a lot on this show because all the great stuff that's going on around here is, well, it's going on around here. It's a part of our great state that has something for everyone. From big city culture and awesome urban adventures to eclectic eateries and sensational suburban surroundings, it's got it all. And that's what I love about this town. No matter who you are or what stage of life you're in, it has everything you need to, well, begin. Grand Rapids is located about two and a half hours from my house in mid-lower left Michigan. I know this because, well, I go there a lot. You know, a lot of us drink adult beverages, and some even make their own. But who are the guys that make the stuff that go into the beverages? Oh, look, future adult beverages. Hi, fellers. Meet the mighty men of Pilot Malt House, where quality ingredients make many of Michigan's finest beers and spirits. Yep, these are the malt-making men who connect farmers with brewers by turning bales of barley into award-winning spirits and brews for you. And this is their fearless, but never beerless leader, Eric May, a man who after a home brew or two, knew exactly what he wanted to do. So did you drink a lot of malts when you were a kid? Because that's a gateway activity, you know. Clearly was, yeah. No, is that how you got into it? How did you get into malting? Uh, no, a number of years ago, I started asking questions to local brewers on where they got their ingredients from. Yeah, you know, I just started asking questions on where their malt, what, you know, what was in beer, yeah. and then where it came from, and I just kind of thought to myself, you know, we, we can do this, right? And kind of sparked from there. Well, it's funny you mentioned that, because a lot of us drink beer, but a lot of us don't really realize what is in it or what it takes to, like, I've just figured out what hops are. Just recently, they grow on poles, it's getting big in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But the malting process, I don't even know what malt is or how the process works. How does that all work? Yeah, so when we refer to malt, 90% of the time we're talking about barley. So we started with barley. Which is um, a grain. Which is grain, yeah, right. whole kernel grain. But we also malt with wheat, rye, triticale, um, a number of other grains. We've malted corn, um, oats. And through that process, we basically install the sugars that later create alcohol. Well, what happens to the barley to malt it, to make it malt? So we basically trick it into thinking it's a young kernel in the ground in spring. Um, under controlled conditions, we make it the healthiest and strongest the plant's going to be is right about when it's about to spit through the ground, come through the ground. So through our process, we're taking advantage of that and creating the enzymes that later 
great alcohol along with yeast and, and water. How do you trick it into thinking it's, you show pictures of its mommy, or I mean, <laughs> how do you trick it into thinking that? Uh, basically, through a process. I mean, through, through a week-long process, uh, the first step, we steep it. Right. Uh, makes it want to grow, as well, you know, how I make it, just compressed air and some water. The second phase is germination, where we actually make it grow for a set period of time. Each grain's different. Each grain, even from a different section of the field, will respond differently. And then, uh, yeah, third phase is the kiln. So we uh, heat it up, make it shelf stable, and more importantly, install the, the flavors, aromas that make, may ultimately make the beer. The temperature at which we kiln uh, is it essentially adds the color, creates the color that later you enjoy as a, as a beer. Now, where do you get your grains? Most of it comes from Michigan. So when we started, uh, that was kind of the connection we wanted to make. That you know, the way, when I ask you know brewers around the state, around the really around the Grand Rapids area, where do your ingredients come from? And you know, most of them would say the company name. But I'm like, no, where was it from? Where is it? Where was it grown? And what's neat about what you guys are doing is you guys are like the malted middlemen. You guys are connecting the farmers with the brewers. At the end of the day, I want to sit down and drink a beer with a guy that brewed a beer with the guy who grew the grain. And that's, you know, that's how we started. That's, you know, I remember years ago, we said, did that for the first time, and it, every single time it hasn't gotten old. It's fun. Well, also what's neat about what you're doing is it's part nature, part science, and part art. And coming to an independent malter like you, like you said, you can get custom malts done for whatever microbrew that you're doing. As opposed to just getting the standard stuff, you're getting something that's customized. Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of custom projects, you know, and we like to listen to what people want and get better every day for them. After filling my head with a mixture of malted memories, Eric had me cover my feet, fill my hands with a shovel, and then he put me to work with pilot of production, John Brenner. I do notice that the boots you gave me match, match my shovel. <laughs> they're, they're pretty, aren't they? <laughs> Okay, what are we doing? So what we're doing right now is called steeping out. We're draining the water out of the tanks right now. Once, it, once the uh, timing just gets right with the water, we open the gate, kind of let all the grain just roll into the germination box. And our job is to um, shovel it, shovel it out, because it's going to mound right up. So you need to push, right. it, push it towards the back. So it doesn't like spill over and get on Correct. to my white boots you yeah, guys are you making me those, wear. Don't want those wet. I'm ready. Excuse right. me. That's coming. You sure that's not beer? That's not beer. Oh, wow, look. Oh, my gosh. How am I doing so far? Oh, oh perfect, gosh. man. Doing good. Holy cow. Speed up a little. It's coming out. Oh, OK. <sighs> it smells kind of like breakfast cereal. So next time you have a frosty, cold adult malted beverage or a Michigan-made spirit, don't just thank the brewers or distillers. Give a nod to the farmers and malt makers who made it all possible. Then, uh, if you don't mind, please pass the pretzels. Mmm. You know, on UTR, we figured out real early in season one that food is the single biggest trigger for human beings. And for us, too. Because let's face it, we love to eat. And we love sharing our great food finds with you guys. Well. After we eat there, of course, <laughs> priorities. Now, if you want to have a great restaurant, your concept and cuisine have to connect with the community. And when it comes to offering eateries that do just that, Corey DeMint is making his mark. His mission is simple. Bring good food and great gathering places to neighborhoods that need them. And in Alger Heights, he gave him a great one with the old goat. I'm not just trying to float your goat, but this place, it's very cool. Thanks, Tom. I mean, the first time, I mean, we just walked in a minute ago. Who's the inspiration for the lighting in this place? Uh, my brother and I built all the lights. I don't know, it's just kind of this weird vibe that we had when we purchased the building going with what was already here. Yeah. And it kind of had an industrial theme to it with the exposed rafters. So we went with that, and you know, at night when the lights kind of come on, it creates almost a faux ceiling. So you get these lights shining down, and the mix of industrial and farm and fresh food and things kind of all ties in and goes together. I love it because none of it makes sense, but it works. Yeah, I've heard that before. I mean, when people ask me, what, what, what do you do? What's your theme? What kind of food do you serve? And I just say, well, it's, it's moody food. I mean, I. <laughs> Whatever the food is, is whatever mood I'm in, and whatever mood strikes me, including the lights, is what we do. So this place is your third endeavor? Well, three and a half or, or, or four. We have the Electric Cheetah, which was my first restaurant on Wealthy Street. 
Just down the road from there is Uncle Cheetah's Soup Shop, which kind of split off due to its popularity and became Auntie Cheetah's Soup Shop, because we had space in the old goat here, which used to be our bar that kind of turned into our soup shop area now. So now we serve soups out of there too. And then yes, we have the old goat restaurant as well. But your specialty is bringing good cuisine to communities, right? Finding places yeah. that needs it and then finding the right mix of food. I don't go where the trends are, usually. I used to live in Alger Heights, so I knew as a resident of Alger Heights, I would have loved to have a place that I could walk out my front door and stroll down the street and have a family restaurant to go to. And that's big too, it's not just a bar, it's a full dining experience. We believe that the food and the beverages and everything goes together to create a full experience, so that's what we wanted for Alger Heights. Now, the food here is, how would you describe it? It's just, what, well, like you said, your mood? It, it, it's moody food. I tell the guys in the kitchen, Southern, Cajun, German, Polish. It's, it's an amazing variety of cuisines, absolutely. It can feel a little bit like too much. However, the roots of Southern, Cajun, German, Polish, they encompass such hospitality and such big, bold flavors. In the summer, we're more towards the Southern and Cajun side. In the winter, we're more towards the German and Polish side. The gravies, the sauces, the schnitzels, the roasted meats, the spice, the big, bold flavors that come from those cuisines, it works to be able to go a little heavier in the winter and the summer utilizing the fresh foods from Michigan sources. And then we get real dark and heavy in the winter and you know hunker down for the cool weather and bring out the gravy and slather it on everything. Yeah, I love restaurants that do that, where the changes with the seasons, it changes with depending on what's available to serve. You can change with depending on the mood of the community. Sure, and people are being a little bit more realistic about where their food comes from and what they want to eat. And seasonally, absolutely, you're in a different mood. It's colder and you need a little bit more sustenance. So we do it that way. Yeah, it's old school. It's the way they still do it in Europe. It's the way we used to do it a long time ago, and it's, we're finally getting back to that where... I hope so. It's just yeah. how we like to eat. I mean, we like to eat real food. We eat big, we eat a lot, but we eat real food. Now, tonight, I understand, is German night. It's German night at the Old Goat. One of our most favorite old, old-time restaurants in Grand Rapids was called the Schnitzelbank. Yeah. And just like we like to bring people here to gather together, my family used to gather when we'd all come in from out of town. We'd meet at the Schnitzelbank. We loved German food. We loved everything about the Schnitzelbank. So we're putting on the same kind of thing here where we pick some of the more popular dishes that Schnitzelbank did and serve it in the manner that they did with, they had a lentil soup and a house salad and they served bread with butter and spread it on it. We served beer in the Steins and just kind of pay tribute to uh, what was um, a very popular destination restaurant downtown and the only German restaurant in Grand Rapids, which now I think Thursday night is about the only place that you can get German food in the entire city. Well, since we were there on German night, I thought it best to channel my inner Ernst and start sprechen with das Munchen Menschen. Yeah. So I understand you're here for German night. Yes. Well, they actually brought me in because I'm a real German, authentic German person. You're probably having trouble with my accent. But sure, I, yeah. 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 I notice you're having an authentic German hamburger. Yes. All the way from Hamburg. Yes. <laughs> I also noticed you brought some reading material. Yes, I did. It's a bestseller. I love him. I love him. You're aware it's German night, right? I am, right. but my first time at German night. Oh, so, do you have a dog at home? We do have a dog. Is it a German shepherd? <laughs> it is not. Oh. So what's better, this or this? Ooh, I like it straight. Thank you. Have you been here before? I do, I love this place. Why? I just love the environment, I love the decor, honestly. I just think it's a really cozy place to be. You know it's a nice German night. German night, yes, I love it. No, you mean, yeah, I love it. Yeah. I even had the kielbasa and the crowd and the spätzle. I did. <laughs> das ist gut, ja. <laughs> so I understand you're related to the uh, accordion player. He's my neighbor. And really? he's really good. Really? We came here for the music and the food. Really? So did I. Thank you so you much. You can have it. Enjoy it. <laughs> so, do you like the food here at the Old Goat? Oh, das ist gut. <gasps> Wunderbar, ja. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I spy dry fear foop. That's all I know. Foop? Is that a number? <laughs> foop? On UTR, we always say that if you really want to understand a community, eat where the locals eat. And in Alger Heights, the fine folks will tell you the awesome edibles at the Old Goat are all you need to know. 
Oh, and it's okay to eat there now. <laughs> We're done. You know, every time I snack, I go to my happy place. But I didn't know where it was until now. <laughs> That's right. If you're a serious snacker, like the whole UTR crew, you need to know about Cheese Curls Incorporated, a snack food company that's been making mouth-watering munchies for the masses right here in Michigan for over 50 yummy years. You also need to know the Cheese Curl cousins who live, breathe, and yes, eat it every day, Tim Dedinus and Bob Franzik. So you guys are Cheese Curl cousins. Yes. In a sense, yeah. Really? Yeah. So you guys grew up in the business. Yeah, we grew up the yeah, hard way. That's pretty uh, much all we've ever done. It's all, yeah. we've, all we've ever done. And our fathers were not easy on us at all. I mean, we, uh, we grew up sweeping the floors after school to mixing the cornmeal in the back, slugging 100 pound bags around all day to, uh, you know, During work the when everybody else was out having fun. Well, I read a story about you guys that your dad would like come in your bedroom at six in the morning and go, so-and-so, yes. uh, it's not making it. You got to come in and work the such and such machine. Yeah. And you're like, okay, okay. I, I knew I was golden when I was little, uh, younger, I should say, high schoolish, when uh, I, I'd hear the garage door go up in the morning and the garage door go down in the morning without him heading my bedroom door. I knew I didn't have to go to work, but if I heard the garage door go up and I heard his hand on my bedroom door, I knew I was going to work. No, no ifs, ands, or buts, you were going. So this huge operation started as a little family business. Correct. Yes. yes. Our father started way back in 1963, 64-ish, right? Correct. And uh, just, it's just kind of grown from there. Wow. The warehouse alone looks like uh, Raiders of the Lost Snack. It's unbelievable how much stuff you guys are making now. What's the one product that started the whole thing off? The product that's standing behind us right here, cheese, cheese curls. curls. Cheese curls. The crunchy yeah. cheese curl. Yeah. Way back in the 60s? Yep. Back in the early 60s, yeah. What that's, was it called back then? That's your corn curls. They, back then they didn't put cheese on it. It was just corn with uh, some salt on it. How many different products do you guys make now? We make, I believe it, 12 different items but with all multiple different flavors. We put, add up all the, the uh, items with the flavors, it comes out to about 60 different items. And you guys make private label stuff for a lot of different companies. Correct, yeah. that's where our mainstay is. That's where our focus is, is uh, making private label, making cheese curls and bacon fried extreme snacks for companies all across the country. Right here, right here in Western Michigan. That's amazing. So you guys are making snacks, but you're also making a big economic statement. I mean, you employ a lot of people. We do employ a lot of people, and they're great people. I know this is a family business, and that in and of itself, it makes you proud, but what makes you the proudest of what you guys are doing? Oh, I guess the, the steps that we have taken after we took over for our father, growing the business the way that we have, and uh, have more than doubled the workforce, added more products, and I guess just the way that we've grown it and the long-term employees that we have with us as well. We've got a great crew that have been with us for, for quite a while, and uh, that kind of makes it happen. Well, I think I'm having a snack attack. You guys better get me to one of your designated snacking stations. Let's go. Let's go look at something different. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. Come on. Snack attack. All this exposure to tasty convenience cuisine got me so stoked, I couldn't help but get right into the act. I'm telling you right now, the Vexor valve is all wrong. You're going to have to recalibrate the thingamajig uh, because the inertias are all wrong here. Yeah, Tom, I think we got a better job for you. Oh, OK. One, two, three, five, uh, uh, seven. Uh, darn it. <laughs> so next time you have a snack attack, consider keeping it right here in Michigan at Cheese Curls Incorporated, because they make homegrown goodies that'll satisfy even the most sophisticated snacker. You know, like me. Yeah, it's a lot, but I've got the guys to consider too. Well, now it's time to get creative. So on UTR, we're gonna go to UICA and see some ART. Pretty SMRT. Right downtown Grand Rapids is the right place for you to go if you love modern art. It's the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts, 
and it's four floors of some of the most progressive and creative experiences and works of art you will ever encounter. There's a lot to see here, so to make sure it all sinks in, I made some time for Miranda Krajniak. She's the executive director at the Institute, and her passion for this pursuit couldn't be more direct. This place really is more than a museum. Actually, it's not a museum at all. It is not a museum. It's really, um, it's a community art experience. Yes, it's an art center. So one of the things that sets us apart is we don't have a collection. So our dedication to contemporary art means that we change all the time. Once we become holders of the past, we stop looking to the future. So all new artwork, all the time, always something new. Well, that's wonderful because you've got four floors here and a theater, yeah. and so people can come here and always see something new. And that's what people want. People want new experiences all of the time. This must be fun for you. I mean, if you're creative and you love art, to be able to collaborate with artists in the community and to bring people in and constantly experiment, that must be a blast. This is the coolest job in Grand Rapids, yeah. pretty much. Now, the UIC has been in existence for 40 years, but how long have you been in this cool building? We've been here since 2010. This is our fifth building. And the art community in Grand Rapids is huge. I mean, not just because of art prize, yeah, it's pretty but there, awesome. there are so many creative people here. Do people line up to try and get their exhibits in here? Yes, they do. <laughs> oh, wow. And then, then they line up to see them. <laughs> Yeah, they really do, and it's really important. UICA supports artists, so all of our artists get payment, they get supported, and we're trying to advance their careers. Well, like you said, this place is constantly changing. It's a reflection of us today, and I don't know, it just gives you a chance to show us who we are right now and take an abstract, sometimes funny, sometimes thoughtful look at mm -hmm. who we are, which is, it's so much different than the old idea of a museum. It is, and it encompasses new versions of people, right? There's, there's kind of the tried and true museum. You kind of know what you're getting. One of the things about contemporary art is it brings in all kinds of perspectives, and it reflects us right now. So this art is a reflection of our society as we're living it, so it can be uncomfortable. It's hard to understand what's happening in politics, in the world, with famine and wars and social media. And these artists are trying to distill that into a visual medium for people. Tell me about the installation we're standing in the middle of right now. So this is Rick Beerhorst. This is all new work. Rick Beerhorst has been making work for 25 years in Grand Rapids. He's a beloved West Michigan artist. But he had been doing really small folk art themed work for about 20 years. Um, and he wanted to make a change. And so we said, if you bring us all new work, you can have a show. Because we really want to give a reason to make new work, have an end game for that work. It's a real incentive for artists to move forward. And this is it. The installation that is when you come in the front door and you turn right, come down the ramp. Uh -huh. Tell me about that one. I don't know if they're candy or what are they? They're wax. So that's Michael Peoples, and that is his homage to his grandfather, who was a lover of circus peanuts. And so it's food is memory. Because, you know, food is our deepest connector to memory, smell and food. Right. Are they candy? They're not. They're wax. They're, they're crayons. That explains why I have a tummy ache. <laughs> you know, I've always said that art is the icing on the cake of life. And this place is four layers of some of the most inspiring icing your brain will ever eat. So stop by the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts and enlighten your frontal lobes. I promise. They'll thank you for it. Oh, and if you ever find yourself in the Grand Rapids area, remember, there's something here for everyone. And last time I checked, your name was on that list. Hey there. Want to know more about all the great places we go on the program? Just go to our website. You can watch episodes, tell us where to go, jump to our Facebook page, and even buy a hat like mine. So just go to utrmichigan.com. That's utrmichigan.com. Go now. Or now. Support for Under the Radar provided by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, dedicated to shared economic success. MEDC promotes the state's assets and opportunities that support business investment, job growth, and community vitality. What if the world was a blank canvas and our imagination the brush? We would use only the most vibrant colors, the most dramatic strokes, Creating a world of endless expression and endless possibilities. Creating a world like Grand Rapids, where every day is a work of art 
and the inspiration is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. DestinationAnnArbor.org is your gateway to Chelsea, Dexter, Manchester, Milan, Celine, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor. Find out the best spots to eat, festivals to attend, activities to do, and places to discover at DestinationAnnArbor.org. There's something special about the pride, the skill, and the passion it takes to build something great. The Construction Association of Michigan, CAM, understands that passion and has been providing contractors with the resources they need since 1885. 